आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Hello friends today we have in our midst Karan Bajaj an Indo-American author let me give a brief introduction before for the benefit of all our listeners before we finally uh, take off with the interview right Karan Bajaj is a is a best selling uh, novelist whose books have been sold more than 200000 copies in india right you have about more than 200000 copies wow that's amazing and in, that is keep off the grass johnny gone down the seeker and the yoga of max's discontent published by harper collins and penguin random house right correct yeah uh, a striving yogi that was very interesting to know that you know karan has taken 3 year long sabbatical to pursue his interest in spirituality backpacking and hiking it's indeed a pleasure to have you here with us in our studios of all india radio and uh, well when did you really get down to writing this book or when i started just when you started let's come yes. just from the beginning how you started about doing it and then maybe we come back to this book wonderful thank you for asking that question and it's actually a seminal point in my own life as well because i wrote my first novel almost uh, 15 years ago in 2008 till then i was at a in a corporate path i was uh, i graduated from the indian institute of management in bangalore i am bangalore and i was with procter and gamble for 6 years so uh, and i left my job to a backpack i didn't have a idea that i would write a novel during that time but i left my job to backpack around the world and i had uh, lived in south america for a few months and then central uh, asia mongolia etc for a few months and then i felt that those experiences were very rich and i should write about uh, about that because nobody in india was writing about like you know young indians at that time backpacking and traveling so i wrote that book my first novel keep of the grass in 2008 for me as i said it was a bit of a seminal moment because uh, really after that my life really tra- changed after writing the first novel because uh, what i realized about the creative process was that every creative endeavor takes your entire set of life learnings and uh, puts it into that creative project so the first novel almost was everything interesting that i'd done in my life till that point of time was in the first novel So after that when I uh, when the book came out it was reasonably successful and when I started writing a second book I realized that I had nothing to write about. So I uh, I, I you know I st- filled my life with interesting experiences again and that became a bit of a pattern in my uh, creative uh, endeavors that I would you know uh, do interesting things and write about them. And if I hadn't done that first creative endeavor I would never have had like that experience to keep living an interesting life keep filling it with experiences putting it into a creative project so i think my learning was that i wish i'd started my first creative uh, act earlier um are your books a uh, sequence to another each one following the other is is are you maintaining a certain pattern there or and a sequence which is going in again a good question because i think every book whether it's a non fiction this one is a non fiction book the first three novels were fiction of course but i would say every book is autobiographical in some senses so you fill your life experiences with them and so as i kept evolving as a person uh it it like you know the books kept changing so the first book was very backpacking oriented then i had taken another year off uh, to go very deep into yoga and meditation i'd become a yoga teacher in a sevananda ashram in south india and then uh, learned meditation in the himalayas and the third novel was very inspired by that This is a non-fiction book which is based uh, heavily from my own startup experience. What was your biggest motivation behind writing all these books? Uh different times different motivations but at uh, I think the underlying motivation at every point was that I felt that there were a certain set of life experiences which I wished many more people could experience. So I wanted to make it accessible for more people. So as I said in the first novel it was about backpacking in the third novel it was about how a spiritual quest could be a very interesting pulsating kind of a quest and not a something that old people do when they are retired it's something which young people uh, uh, could do so for example when i had written that novel uh, my mother had died of cancer very early she was in her early 50s the novel was called the seeker in india and uh, i had uh, you know i was very interested in knowing meaning of life kind of questions and i had taken like this entire i had gone from europe to india by road backpacking and then lived in an ashram in india for a few months and i thought that was a very pulsating adventurous experience 
and i wished many more people would experience that in this particular novel at the uh, the uh, the freedom manifesto which is my latest non fiction book um, my entire idea was that uh, whatever i'd learned through the act of um, like you know achieving financial freedom uh, i wanted to capture it in the book uh, for many people to read yeah uh, it says like it you bits been very it's a very unconventional and practical with no nonsense in it so what exactly is there in it please let's hear it from you yeah so the book is called the freedom manifesto seven rules to live a life of your calling and uh, why uh, why i wrote this book and also maybe that's why it's being called a little bit unconventional is that uh, when i'd graduated from business school 20 years ago uh, i'd felt that the path to success was very linear right you joined a job you did well in it and you kept growing my actual life experience taught me that actually uh, there are multiple paths towards what we would term as conventional success and my own path was a really winding path so as i said i in the middle of my corporate career i left to backpack then again i did again well in my corporate career but i left to learn yoga and meditation for a year then again i did quite well i was the head of craft in uh, in the us uh, for for a large portfolio for craft and i left that to become a full time writer then i became the head of discovery in india uh, discovery channel in india and i left that to start a company what i realized was that i was choosing these very intense growth experiences and during the time i was choosing them i felt very insecure because uh, the path uh, that we had seen was a more conventional straightforward path in which you chose one field and did very well at that but i was kind of going through these detours from writing to yoga uh, along with my corporate career to starting a tech company eventually doing well with that uh, but i saw that uh, you know the path to success could be very divergent and if you follow your curiosity very deeply and you choose very intense growth experiences you grow so much as a person that the world rewards you for that so if you are working in a job but you take a year off to learn yoga you'll grow so much as a person that you realize that eventually the world rewards you for that so i wanted to uh, share those journeys so that people were inspired to not just choose one single linear path to success but also to you know realize that winding roads in which you choose very intense growth can have a equally proportionate impact on uh, you know success in the world if you will yeah Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. <laughs> hey, what is your purpose of writing this, and why this is seven yeah. rules? Why not it was six or eight or yeah. less, you know, or more? So yeah. why have you stuck up to the seven rules to live the life of your calling? I think there are some numbers that are just mystical in some ways, like mm-hmm. three, mm-hmm. seven. So they just mystically just stick. I think in some form. So when I set out to define what i'd learned in this like winding journey of like pursuing corporate life with creative endeavors with spiritual endeavors i when i started to look down at the principles they kind of like boiled down you know surprisingly into seven principles that i thought were you know somewhat particular and unique so that's why i wrote about them okay yeah. so you start to the to do the lucky number 7 <laughs> yeah it was a bit of a lucky number 7 yeah and uh, yes the freedom the freedom manifesto which is in itself uh, you know manifesto is always you know raising ears and you know like yeah. everybody's like okay alert with it so what is this freedom manifesto that you're talking about uh, yeah the way? the idea of the freedom manifesto is that uh, in order to achieve a level of uh, i would say spiritual freedom you have to truly follow your calling if you will truly follow your heart your instinct and i think with this book i was uh, almost um, enabling others to have that permission that you could do that and still achieve the conventional parameters of success you know so that's the idea behind the book so let's hear even from you another thing i would like to know is the seven rules that you're talking about in this in a in in brief yeah i'll talk about the seven rules i'll i'll give you examples of the seven rules rather than going into each of them there is one rule which is uh, uh, called the net impact rule which i figured out through my own experiences that uh, we always think like how do you achieve more success how do you achieve more wealth but i guess if you change that question around and ask uh, how can i impact more people okay typically anybody who impacts a lot of people whether that's a actor who you know creates art that like really touches a lot of people or um entrepreneur who creates a company that many millions of people are using the services for like a microsoft or a tesla those people are actually the people who have the most conventional wealth or success right so if you flip that question around on how can i achieve success to how can i think of living a life which has the largest 
impact in terms of the magnitude of people that you touch and how deeply you touch them then suddenly that question is like you know flipped around its head and it gives you very different ways of thinking about it and actually if you execute that you realize that you're uh, you'll have more success or or like you know so for example when i uh, you know like i was uh, i successfully sold my company or uh, my company was acquired for about a few hundred million dollars uh, whitehead junior and i think the reason it was was because it was used by a lot of students and uh, created jobs for a lot of teachers so i think if you flip the question on how can you have a lot of impact then um, the conventional success follows so i think the rules are somewhat similar to that um, mm-hmm. on you how know, to, go about how to think it, about yeah. a mindset a little bit uh-huh. different sh- shifting your mindset on the questions that you ask mm-hmm. and going from a unit of yourself to like uh, the unit of the world and seeing how you can have a larger effect there and you'll suddenly see that all of the things that you want happen very quickly for you is it without breaking the conventional thinking and the, the conventional thoughts that you already have acquired or learned yeah. down the ages i think we've uh, learned for example I, i in my own path i learned uh, some things along the way which i would say are a bit like uh, like when you when you reflect on them they are uh, not unconventional but uh, like for example i learned in the path that uh, you know when you choose moments or experiences of extraordinary growth as an individual the world eventually not in the short term but in the long term you always get rewarded for it by the world so when i came back from my one year of learning yoga and meditation it was actually quite tough to re-enter corporate world i was in a very you know a, like a like a senior position in the corporate world right when i kind of re-entered that the initial phases were a little bit like uh, you know finding a job again after taking a year off like you know adjusting to the job but i'd grown so much from that period i was so uh, silent you know much more resilient because in an ashram you were living with 60 people in a dorm room with one shared bathroom right so i was living like that for months so i'd come back with it with a very deeper appreciation of what really matters right you don't need a lot of stuff in your life you need to like I, you know so things like that had changed me as a person and i saw that the growth that was happening within was eventually reflected in the world i became a ceo at a very young age because again you change with these intense growth experiences so much that the world rewards you for them eventually not immediately but eventually that's a very noble so, thought it is a real thought though that's the funny yeah, part yeah, right uh, yeah. i had always learned that uh, you know i'd always been th- i'd always thought that it, you had to be very just choose one field keep working at it be consistent with it but i've already learned is that if you choose these very panoramic growth experiences and grow tremendously as an individual mm-hmm. you'll actually end up in very good places yeah when you talk about these rules is it important for everybody to follow these rules in order to achieve what they want to uh i would say i would Or think one can of, deviate no no obviously <laughs> one should deviate and can deviate to listen to their own calling i would think of them as more frameworks rather than rules so for example one framework i put in the book as is a part of one of the rules i talk about is uh that if you think of uh, any significant story like a book uh, or a movie that you like for example say three idiots you know you always have very similar frameworks there is a lead character who has a very big objective and in order to achieve that big objective they end up with a lot of conflict in the path in three idiots for example they want to change the education system so there's a lot of conflict in their path and as a result their li- their stories are very big and uh, you know in the climax even if they win or lose you really your heart goes for the hero and when you start thinking about it your life is actually very similar so if you set a very big objective for your life there'll be a lot of conflict in your path but in the end uh, you live a very good story and your life will be a very good story so in a way it's a framework now i haven't said like what you should do but if you whenever you are at a crossroads just uh, make a decision of growth versus fear because uh, growth will you know uh, will lead you to a big life and a big story and decisions of fear typically uh, will make your life very small right and our uh, heroes in yeah. books and movies always choose paths of like great growth and that's why they are you know that's why we admire them and in a way your life is the same so it's like a framework more than a rule i would say yeah yeah the fears will just dissolve fears will dissolve and yeah if you cho- if you make decisions based on fear then yeah, your life right. gets smaller and smaller if you make decisions based on growth it's a very up and down life but it gets bigger and bigger Yeah. Okay, so that is your seven rule thing. Right? Yeah, like I was saying, it's a framework. Like for for me personally, for example, I when uh, we were pregnant with our second daughter, right, uh, and my first daughter was very young. That's the time I decided to leave my corporate career to become a full time writer. Similarly, when I was uh, the head of discovery in India, I decided to leave that to start my own company, 
when my kids were just about to enter the school system and i realized that uh, you know those decisions are full of like struggle and anguish and anxiety but if you have made, made those like big decisions they typically end up with like you know there'll be big conflicts in your path but you actually end up with a very like a large life you know so i think that's what i uh, tried to say in the book yeah there's something another uh, question which i would like to know from you is you talk about um, being free financially you know but but you see the world is running after finance because that is your bread and butter that was how yeah. do you survive mm-hmm. and how does Correct. one yeah how do you you know put it in your manifesto yeah so i did written a little bit about financial as i said like uh, what i've seen again and again is that the people with the most wealth are also the people who generally had the most impact in the world so i think if you flip the question around and say that like you know my unique personality how do i increase the magnitude of my impact in the world you'll suddenly realize that wealth becomes an outcome of it and not the like almost the input of it right the outcome of it is wealth if you choose the input of magnitude or a magnitude of impact mm-hmm. yeah which rule actually inspired you the most for putting it down i would say there is a rule called 90% failure 100% learning okay okay mm-hmm. what that means is that whenever you start a zero to one creative endeavor and i've been fortunate to see three industries now fiction writing uh, like you know where you're creating a zero to one a novel from scratch television channels because i was the head of discovery in india launching television channels or media very similar dynamics in movies and television channels you're starting something zero to one and startup because i've founded my own company white hat junior and scaled it uh, you see a very similar pattern across these three industries that your success rate is 10% so 90% of books that come out every year fail uh, 90% of television channels and movies that come out every year fail they don't make their money and 90% of startups every year will fail these are funded startups funded movies funded startups leave alone all the self publishing endeavors that happen but you should still do them because you'll fail 90% of the time but you learn 100% of the time you learn a lot about yourself you learn a lot about the world and you learn a lot about how to make your next endeavor better mm-hmm. and eventually if you keep taking these shots of creating zero to one uh, you know creative endeavors one of them will work so so in a way what i suggest in this book is that look expect that there'll be a 90% failure when you create something no matter which field you create it in but keep creating multiple of them and eventually your uh, success rate will happen how practical are these rules um i mean they are from my life <laughs> like so as it's like a <laughs> See, like you not, have, no you part of me you had a very beautiful life in the sense okay you already have been a successful writer a successful uh, business person and you know there's a lot of things there but uh, a la- another person like a double person who's going to be reading it yeah. um will say all right will these rules apply to me can i really apply these rules in doing something what i want to do so from a different yeah i think from success a simple uh, ordinary yeah, man yeah. a simple ordinary man how does one person how do you perceive this so i'll say this thing right i think success uh, like you know after two decades everything seems successful but you know everything you miss the points in the middle so for example my third novel which was published in the us for the for, or my first novel published in the us was rejected 61 times mm-hmm. so over a period of two years when i was writing full time I got rejected like every month for a few, like you know two three times and I kept improving the novel and I kept improving the novel. So what I would say is that uh, you know it's accessible to everybody if you're ready to be rejected 61 times you can get a great novel published if you're ready to take a few shots at truly cracking a startup then it's accessible to you but if you expect that in the first shot you'll be successful then it's a then i think none of the rules would make too much sense for you know uh, for really no like the my rules nor i guess the world's rules will make much sense because yeah. that's just like wishful right. thinking but mostly right. the period of these uh, the, these like you know zero to one creative endeavors are that they are always uh, fraught as i said 90% failure rate so you will go through that uh, you know failure rates and then eventually uh, if you keep taking enough chances then one of them will work what's your intention behind writing this especially for the youth my intention is the same i think i when i was 20 years old i thought there was only one path to success you join a company you stick to the field of work that you're in and you do do very well and mm-hmm. you keep growing and keep, keep doing better at better at it and eventually one day you'll succeed my life taught me something else altogether that you should just choose extremely intense growth experiences that speak to your soul and the world eventually rewards you for that growth so i guess my simple motivation for writing this book was that uh, choose your own winding path you know and uh, kind of follow your own 
insanity and like you know and you'll you'll as long as your intentions are good and you truly are choosing growth you'll land up in the right place that's fantastic yeah. well these are the seven rules to live the life of your calling uh, to set you free not just financially but also help you to be the best of your own self that you want to be in this world thank you so much mr karan bajaj for being here with us in our studios it was indeed a pleasure talking to you my pleasure thank you for your wonderful questions